Thank committee. That's what I think we are all going to be excited about and definitely has been needed. Dr. Burnett. Thank you, President Gregg and members of the board and Dr. Waddell. Uh, you have uh, some information in front of you about uh, the uh, process that you could be used. You could be used to establish a bond oversight committee and how that group might function. Because, as Mr. McDaniel pointed out, and as others of you have pointed out uh, uh, in other venues, the uh, the need to uh, to guide and direct the uh, bond building program is one that faces the district and we're simply bringing forth a process that you could use to establish a citizens committee that would work with uh, the staff, myself, uh, Mr. Perry, uh, Mr. Williams, in uh, looking at the projects as well as our technology and looking at the projects and uh, uh, determining looking at the expenditures of those projects and then would make independent reports to the board uh, on a quarterly basis or at some other at some other uh, timeline as you uh, uh, directed and would bring you uh, their take on how the projects are going, what the list was that we looked at that the district uh, committed to in 2008, uh, the progress that we're making on that and uh, uh, any suggestions for redirections or reallocations or other ideas that, that the committee might bring forward. So uh, we bring this to you as an information item as a process by which you uh, may want to consider. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Rogers, uh, non-school use of school facilities. Uh, thank you, Madam President, board members, Dr. Waddell, and I owe uh, Ms. Hale a great segue into this topic. Yeah. So, uh, uh, actually, she and I visited the other day, a great conversation. Uh, what you have in front of you is um, earlier uh, this summer I had several board members that uh, sent concerns to me or to other people in operations regarding the, the use or abuse of some school facilities, uh, particularly uh, fields. And so I did a little research um, and talked to uh, Coach Mays, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Williams, uh, talking about who's entitled to use. And of course that leads to actually a board policy, GKD Local. And of course if you look at GKD Local, the first paragraph talks about the district shall permit non-school use of designated district facilities for educational, recreational, civic, or social activities when these activities do not conflict with school use or with this policy. It goes uh, further down on that page, it talks about no approval shall be required. So. One of the issues that we've got to sort out as a district is what, what groups uh, should be allowed use of these facilities. For instance, the group that uh, Ms. Hell talks about is actually an organi organized group. We have other organized groups that use our school facilities, but they, have, they go through the local municipalities. For instance, Louisville Football Association, they're associated with City of Louisville Parks Department or Driven Football associated with Town of Flower Mound Parks Department. They are then given interlocal use agreements. In other words, they can use our facilities without having to pay rentals and so on. Groups like Ms. Hell is alluding to, those do not have those kind of uh, same uh, rights. And so we uh, certainly must shore up uh, or consider how we want to enforce its policy. Yet we've got to be careful about not excluding those neighborhood walkers that walk around our tracks and so on. And so I put in front of you, uh, we actually did some investigation regarding how could we, what would be the best ways to enforce uh, policy and, and prevent the abuse of our facilities, uh, specifically, ex, you know, outside facilities. We could fence all of them in, and uh, I quote there an estimate from Mr. Williams about what it would take to fence in our middle school facilities, and that'd be about uh, $250,000 to $280,000 for cost prohibitive. Uh, we also, Coach Mays, talked to all the police chiefs in the five main municipalities that we have these problems, and of course, 
we could issue uh, criminal trespass warnings, but they, you know, suggested we need to have better signage, so on. And of course, then still those folks are going to be warned the first time, and so on. Uh, when we specifically talk about a group like the soccer group at Old Delay or Cornell Center, uh, it is an organized group. I actually requested Coach Mays this past weekend to visit with them. Um, uh, this past weekend, he is uh, actually meeting their representatives up at Facility Services, who handles our rental agreements uh, and facility use agreements uh, this Wednesday. Um, but this is a constant ongoing problem that, that uh, certainly we want to bring to you as an information item and then uh, uh, see where you would like for it to go. Have we had um, many conversations with them in the past about uh, litter and things of this sort from the district? Um, Ms. Gregg, I just recently got involved with this part of it as far as that particular situation. I think what Ms. Hale describes is accurate as far as the, the campus principal uh, actually gave this group permission, which should not have happened. Um, you know, really, uh, they should have gone through facility services. So we've got to shore up our procedures and process, uh, processes to make sure that we, that we treat everyone the same. And that's, that's certainly something that I know Mr. Williams and I will be working on. Kevin, I have a quick question. So, would we need to put signage up that says something to the effect of organized groups need to contact facility services for permission to use field? That way it's open for neighborhood kids who want to go out there. It's open to moms and dads who want to walk or run the track. Um, but I live near Huffines, and Huffines Field was nearly destroyed by an organized youth soccer um, organization who even set up their um, makeshift concession stand every Sunday and we got to pick up the trash that blew from that. Um, how, I'm, I don't think chain link fence would work. <clears throat> that would just get cut through or run over to get through. But do we put up a sign, would that be feasible to put up a sign that Organized groups need to go through facility services for permission? Certainly signs would be feasible. I think, um, Ms. Latham, then what we would have to do is, is make sure we define what an organized group is. It's an organized group, you know, that has six-year-old little soccer team that puts cones out in a 20-yard area, and, and, you know, they're an organized soccer team, but they're not wearing their uniforms or having games or having a practice. So we would have to sort through what we want. But those teams are going through Glassa who are going through the city of Louisville with the interlocal agreement, right? I think most are, but to be honest with you, probably if we went around and asked those groups, you know, they probably wouldn't have any documentation of who did and who didn't have a, you know, the agreement with them, so it, it would be hard to tell. But, but on the flip side, the group like Ms. Hell's describing, there's no reason for that group not to have to go through the same steps, or, you know, rent a field and so on because they're having games there uh, it's my understanding every every weekend well yeah the group at Huffines was too mm -hmm. they had referees line judges <coughs> the whole nine yards if I'm reading this correctly because we don't have signs up that say no trespassing right. there's nothing we can do about it right now is that I think we would have to change policy before we can do anything well, I think you could still ask people to follow the policy and, and, and give someone a warning. You know, even at schools, you don't have to have signs up, and you can you can actually ask the police to give a criminal trespass warning. Uh, then you have to, of course, to go further than that, you're going to have to make sure it's the same person that's been warned the second time. And so that, that's what causes a little bit of difficulty in the enforcement. We need to put some signs up, clean up your mess. <laughs> what 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 is the status of the group at Huffines? I know uh, Mr. Mays went. What what are we doing with them on um, having there? We're taking them to facility services to say that if you're going to continue to use this facility, you're going to have to go through the hoops, which means you have to show liability insurance. You have to you know go through analysis and facility services to rent the facility. 
same as any other outside group could. So they're banned till till that happens. Is that correct? That's what they're discussing on Wednesday. So yes, sir. I mean, we're going to expect them to do the same as any other outside group. And I and I don't want to speak for Mr. Williams. I assume he's here, but really, facility services deals with the rental or use of, of facilities. It's just that operations got involved uh, with this too. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, this is information. I appreciate your efforts, because I know it was a lot of work looking into this. Um, I look forward to hearing your final recommendations. <laughs> this is a hard one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Learning beyond the bell, Mr. Rogers. Ooh, I saw. Thank you, thank you again. Um, Learning Beyond the Bell has been a, uh, an outstanding program that we've had that has provided academic support and other support for uh, children third through fifth graders at five of our neediest uh, elementary schools. It initially began as a 21st century grant. That grant ran out either two or three years ago. Uh, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Riddell were very much involved in uh, working on this program, setting the program up. Um, after the grant ran out, the board graciously decided that they would continue to fund the program. Um, this current year, going into the, the next year, uh, we have an opportunity, uh, Communities and Schools North Texas has just recently gotten a, a grant, which you're, you'll be asked to uh, agree to the MOU later, um, Dr. Haynes. Uh, brought it to the board under consent agenda. And it's an opportunity for us to actually have a joint uh, venture in that they are targeting 110 kids at the same five schools plus two additional schools that we were serving. And so uh, Anthony Figueroa, the outgoing uh, Learning Beyond the Bell administrator who actually left the district um, recently came to us, we were having an informational meeting and suggested that really we were sort of overlapping services and probably competing for the same students. And so we had uh, discussions uh, with uh, Dana Smith from Communities and Schools and other uh, parties which it um, lists in, in your packet. And really it, we came to the agreement that we would, it would uh, suggest that we have a joint agreement between LISD and communities and schools to not only serve the 110 kids that they are targeting at each of the schools, but use some of our funds from Learning Beyond the Bell to target more school, more students at some of the schools, and yet we could then still save um, over $100,000. And so we saw it as a win-win proposal. Combine efforts with communities and schools target more students than what they were serving, <coughs> serving more students at each school, and yet save over $100,000. And so that's the information item that uh, is actually a part of the MOU that you'll be uh, seeing later. Any questions? Thank you. The next item, task fee update 90, local policy update uh, number 90. Every time the legislature um, session is in, then they come back and give us some stuff, huh? Yes, Madam President. Um, but this particular update 90 is uh, from the spring. Okay. And some of the information is cleaned up from the legal, plus a couple of other items. The update that you're referring to will probably be Update 91. I hope somebody can figure it out because it was kind of complicated. And that's what we're waiting on now. Sometime the end of September, maybe into October, we should be looking at Update 91. So in order to get to Update 91, we need to take care of our business with Update 90. And we are using the process as described earlier by Dr. Riddell, starting with the information item. Uh, in your packet of information, under the information item, uh, I tried to highlight the areas that we're going to focus on next uh, month for discussion, and that's in your first bullet. 
uh, two key topics, the new state assessment of academic readiness, that's the STAR program, and Dr. Waddell will visit more about that in just a moment, as well as uh, some technology pieces. There were some areas that were non-substantive that we also consider um, cleanup, and that will also be, that is also in your packet that you have already received uh, and for your review. Uh, the third bullet in your packet um, is recommending um, that this undergo the appropriate district leadership and board. Uh, the, the policy review process requires that the administration reviews it, the board reviews it, and if there's anything in local policy that we need to do the LISD way, then we have the option to change policy as appropriate. If we choose that avenue and we decide to put in some language that's unique for LISD, then that information is forwarded on to our representative at TASB for legal review and for crafting into board policy language. That's what is, uh, will occur between the discussion, hopefully, and the action. So we have minimal uh, changes and we should be on schedule for October read. Uh, in this particular policy update, there are minimal changes. Significant, but um, minimal in terms of doing a lot of crafting. Most of the crafting has already been done for us, and Dr. Waddell, excuse me, Riddell will talk to us about the options uh, that she and her group have been going through to identify those issues with STAR program. As you reviewed the document, you also saw some language, local policy language that is directly uh, reflected to you and the use of technology. I don't think there's anything really unusual about the language because you know how to conduct your business in terms of using the appropriate technology when and where. But there is a need to put uh, information uh, to all school boards in the state of Texas. So this is more of an information item. I don't see really anything significant that would affect how we conduct our business and you, you use your technology. The second major item uh, Dr. Riddell will talk to you about. And uh, she'll also visit with you about the STAR committee that's also highlighted in the bullet. The next part, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, uh, we'll be visiting uh, with you about those in fuller detail. And, and you will not just hear from me. I'm the sort of the designated spokesperson in terms of working through policy. My colleagues in their area of expertise will actually uh, visit with you in the discussion item. Dr. Uh, Riddell will take charge of the STAR program uh, Ms. Brown will be working with the technology piece. Uh, so, you know, I'll chime in when I need to, but when we work with policy, I'm working with my colleagues. This is, these are not my ideas. These are my colleagues and their staff's recommendations to you, and we'll be a little more thorough in the discussion next month. Thank you. Our next item for discussion, uh, the demographic study overview by Dr. Burnett. Thank you, President Gregg. Uh, we've got uh, several things that are moving together. The demographic study is certainly a critical piece of this, and you, you had received a copy, I believe, last week, and we have our demographer, uh, Brent Alexander, I believe, is uh, scheduled in here to give us a, a very brief overview. Thank you. tonight. Um, what I want to do tonight is quickly uh, review some of the key highlights of the demographic study that we completed earlier this summer. I believe that most of you have, uh, have a copy and had a chance to review um, the topics. Um, I know we have a short period, so let's go ahead and get started. 
Let's begin by looking at several of the demographic trends since the 2010 census began to be released, or the results from the 2010 census began to be released uh, this past spring. I thought it would be interesting if we started with local population growth. On this slide, you can see uh, the 2010 census results show that Denton County's total resident population increased by nearly 230,000 from 2000 to 2010. That's a 5% uh, average annual increase. The uh, total resident population within uh, Louisville ISD uh, increased by 79,000, and that is a 4% annual increase. And you can see there in purple, the district enrollment for all grades increased by uh, 12,400 students uh, for the 10-year period, and that represents a 3.2% uh, average annual increase. Now this, this chart shows the district's enrollment since 2002. Um, the, the growth pushed the, the district's uh, student enrollment from just over 39,000 in 2000 to uh, 51,484 uh, this uh, past fall. Uh, the key trend to note here is that the major student growth primarily occurred in the first half of the decade when uh, the district was experienced 3 to 4 percent annual growth or uh, 1,500 to 200 new students per year. Since 2007, the district has averaged 1.2% um, annual growth. Um, but keep in mind that that 1.2% still translates into 500 to 600 new students per year. And one interesting note that despite the recent slowdown, um, LS, LISD saw the second most uh, enrollment growth from 2000 to 2009 behind uh, the uh, Frisco ISD among the 10 neighboring districts. Now, a closer look at the annual growth numbers re reveals a couple interesting things. Um, this chart shows the, uh, the annual growth numbers from 2000 through 2010. Um, one of the, I want to point out a couple things. You can see the initial wave of growth from the late 90s ended in 2002. It was followed by a second wave between 2004 and 2006, and since the recession, the, uh, the district's uh, enrollment growth has slowed, as, as Freeman mentioned. Now, what fueled that growth between 2004 and 2006 was a surge in elementary enrollment um, and followed by uh, a high high school enrollment. You can see on these, excuse me, on these blue bars here, between 04 and 06, 800 to 900 new students at the K through five level, and then you can see about 500 students per year were coming in in grades nine through 12. Um, so the the five year average for the K through five has been 231 new students per year, but if you look at a three year average, that's down to 150. Um, the high school enrollment is also trending down from 350 to 400 students per year to 260. And the key takeaway point here is that the district is still growing, just not as fast as it was before the recession. And uh, these, there are smaller class sizes coming up behind these waves. So uh, as a result, you're going to see lower enrollments at the elementary schools, especially on the west side of the district and what you've been used to in recent years. Now, while the enrollment, the enrollment has grown, the um, racial and ethnic profile of the, of the student body has been changing. And uh, the 2010 census revealed that there was an, there's an increasing minority population in Denton County um, over the 10-year period. The uh, white population has declined from 76% to 64%, while the Hispanic population has grown from 12% to 18%. Now, Louisville ISD is more minority than the total resident population in Denton County. And as of 2010, the district's racial distribution is 53% white, 25% Hispanic, 11% Asian and Pacific Islander, and 10% black. Now, uh, the Hispanic growth rate has been faster than the state, but it does mirror the growth seen in Region 11. Um, when you compare the Hispanic growth rate to the 10 neighboring districts, uh, Louisville ISD has added um, 65, just under 6,600 kids from 2000 to 2009, and that makes uh, it the most among the neighboring districts. Now, one, uh, one uh, note that 
you see I do not have 2010 numbers for the comparison districts. Those are um, based on the uh, AIS reports from the TEA. Now, the, uh, the demographic shift then is also uh, reflected in the district birth rates. Uh, uh, mothers living within the district, uh, births from white mothers are down 27%, while births from Hispanic mo mothers have more than doubled. Now, the number of socio, low socioeconomic students has also been increasing. In, two, in 2000, only 9.7% uh, of the district's students were on the federal lunch program. In 2000, the number had grown to 29%. That's an increase of 280% over the 10-year period, or from 3,800 students to 14,500 students. Now, Louisville ISD um, has also added more uh, low NCS students over the 10-year period than any of the 10 neighboring districts. And the rate of growth is faster than the eligibility requirements, which has increased 29% increased over the same period. We also uh, took a look at the number of students per housing type. Uh, using the, the 2010 census um, occupied housing unit data and the student geocoding, um, we have determined that the average number of students per occupied home in the district is 0 0.53 um, over the past five years. The uh, new home markets are yielding uh, 0 0.79 new students per closing. Um, another way that uh, you can see on this slide, that it's also broken out by attendance level. For example, um, right here, basically you're looking at every, every three homes, new homes is producing an elementary student, every five, middle, every five homes is producing a middle school student, and every four is producing a high school student. So, um, one other interesting note on the new home side, 30% uh, of the housing market is a single family uh, townhome duplex condo type products. Those, those products are only producing 0.12 students per house. So the average number of students per multifamily, um, as you know, the district has a uh, vast uh, number of apartment units and that average is 0.28, which is pretty typical for what we see um, for most districts um, with this size of uh, multifamily market. Now the housing market is still a major driver of student growth. Um, in, in Louisville ISD's market remains the sixth largest among all the DFW districts. Um, ending March 31st, uh, the 12 month period produced <coughs> another 610 new homes. And that, that is a 21% decline over the previous year. 44% uh, of the homes sold in the district are um, sold between 300 and 500,000. And the median new home price is 347,358 and compare that to the Dallas-Fort Worth median, which is right at 220,000. And, uh, and move on. The majority of the homes are being sold in the southern and southeastern portion of the district. 40% uh, of the closings occurred in uh, Independence Elementary Zone, and 241 homes were closed in this attendance zone, followed by Hicks, which was right at 10% uh, over the last year. Uh, at the middle school level, the houses are, are being built in the Killian zone. Uh, this is 369 homes over the last year. And this is in both Independence and, and uh, Killian are a direct reflection of uh, Castle Hills. So it's on the market. And both of those schools feed into Hebron. And the Hebron High School zone has 70% of the new home activity over the last year. And they produced. 429 homes. Now going forward, uh, this slide shows you the vacant developed lots on the ground in the district. Um, there are just under 2,500 um, as of the end of March um, for the district's 77 new home subdivisions. And it's also to keep in mind with the housing market struggling as it has uh, 32 of the 77 subdivisions are dormant or suspended or have less than 10 lots and may or may not get finished key point here is that 60% of the vacant lots are in the Hebron zone. So the, the, new, the growth from new housing is going to continue to feed the Hebron high school zone. Um, now, residential development on the west side of 35 is restricted due to uh, large tracts of land being uh, uh, less available. 
of infrastructure and zoning are going to keep those uh, types of developments probably under 50 lots, probably even smaller, and may uh, mean that most of those developments are specialty type products. And what would change that is for the city of Flower Mound to change their zoning and, and for infrastructure to make its way further to the west. But at this point, um, that doesn't look like it's uh, going to happen in the short term. Um, I want to emphasize too when we're talking about lots that the situation is a very fluid. Uh, nearly all major builders are looking at the Hebron um, High School Zone and the city of Flower Mound for opportunities. And since we uh, delivered the study to you, there have been um, multiple strategies that I'm hearing being discussed uh, within the district. So I just want to point out that in the Castle Hills area, in the Windhaven Parkway, uh, even up in the northern portion in the Colony Zone, uh, near Hills of Kingswood, south of Lebanon, and those tracts and lands are being looked at. And also in the uh, 3040 campus area, there's some tracts being looked at. So. All of this rolls up into uh, revised enrollment projections. Uh, prior to the recession, the district was looking like it would, uh, all grades would um, be near 60,000 at the end of the decade. Um, with the, uh, the changes that have occurred since then, um, this chart shows you the K through 12 projections. Uh, and uh, we're looking at K through 12 population was right under 50,000 at the end of um, or excuse me, at last fall, and we are looking at that uh, potentially growing to just over uh, 52,300 by 2020. Uh, if you want to uh, think about what it would be for all grades, you're looking at adding another 1.5 percent uh, to this total. So the, the red line, I will point out, is the cohort survival line. This is this basically basically shows what happens if everything just continues historically as, it, as it's done for the last five years. Um, but the, the two, the blue and the green lines, these are, just, these are blended methodologies where we blend in the historical information with the housing forecast. And so that's why you see that the impact of these, what I showed you in the first couple of slides, the slowdown is causing a, causing a flattening effect. Again, these are conservative estimates, but there, there really aren't any economic indicators that things improving in the short term for the housing industry. Now, I have given you a capacity uh, utilization table in, in the back of your demographic study. But this slide here summarizes the information on that. I, I have in the left-hand column the campuses that are that are underutilized, and when I have uh, when I say underutilized, that means that they are um, projected to remain at or under 90% of functional capacity. Um, so you can see the 11 elementary schools listed there on the top left. And six of those are on the west side of the district, and uh, a couple are in, in the colony. Um, you can see in the middle, or further middle of the left-hand column, uh, four of the the Creek Valley, Downing, Forestwood, and Lakeview campuses that have room, and the Colony High School also uh, has room. Now, the, the, the overcrowded campuses are, are listed in, in the center column, and uh, Castle Hills Elementary, um, Hedrick Elementary, and I want to point out that in your books that we have um, been showing Hicks Elementary on there, but we have made the adjustment for the 150 approximately 150 kids for the zoning change, and I apologize if we were not uh, aware of that change uh, uh, program. But what, what it does do is it, it buys Hicks <coughs> Elementary. I, I have over here on the right some schools that is questionable what happens in a lot of these these particular zones. It will depend on the economy and uh, some of the how some of the tracts of land um, play out, but uh, Hicks um, should, with the zoning change, drop to around 625 um, this fall, um, but it buys it one to two years before the growth from south of 121 pushes it right back up. So the middle schools that are uh, facing overcrowding are Arbor Creek, um, Delay, and uh, Killian. 
Um, I have Briar here and, and McCamey on there, and they have Asterisk by those by their names. Those schools are currently overcrowded, um, but we're projecting them to decline. Those those are some of the larger schools, and they with the uh, as those l larger classes move on, these schools should regain some capacity. They're still expected to be uh, have large capacity or have large enrollments, but they should gain some capacity as some of these uh, larger grade levels move on. This slide's a little bit difficult to read, but basically what I have here is it's a facility needs timeline where I have all of our projections by attendance level, elementary, middle, and high school um, rolled up with their functional and max capacities. Um, you can see here the FM 3040 campus coming in this fall. Um, what this exercise, typically what, how we use this worksheet is, is well as the administration will decide you know, where you, to place uh, the priority of, of uh, the future facilities. Um, but our recommendations from looking at the study at first is that the, the middle school is needed to uh, relieve the Killian and Arbor Creek zones. Um, we recommend that the, the Josie Windhaven location be looked at first. Um, the elementary level, Castle Hills, Hicks, Indian Creek, and Independence could all be relieved by another elementary school, also within the same zone. Uh, now, overcrowding problems on the west side of the, of the district could be done by realignment. I know that's a sensitive topic, but uh, there, as you saw before, there are several schools, both at elementary and middle school, that will have room that could take uh, some of the, relieve some of the schools that are overcrowded. And finally, I think improving the image of the Colony High School um, could help relieve the uh, potential growth that's coming to the Hebron Zone. Those are the quick highlights that I have for you tonight, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, Portman? Ms. Cotton? I um, I was just curious, so this is a more of a consensus of this that you gave us, which I did read. Yes. yes. Could you send that power that presentation to the board electronically, please? This one here. Yeah, because it was easy to read. I mean, I read the whole thing, but still, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot of information, and, you, and it was great. It really was. And, I mean, we be able to use this for years to be able to look and just judge, but still, that's you know, this puts you to sleep, all, but that one. We, we should at least point out that we have tentatively scheduled a uh, more in-depth review of the demographic study on the uh, uh, August 29th special oh, cool. meeting. Great. Did you say that the improved reputation of the Colony High School would help alleviate yes. your sound on that? <clears throat> well, one of the things that I constantly hear from developers and, and builders and, and uh, just the way that uh, the district has handled uh, zoning around the Colony High School is that the perception of the, that the school is that, it, that it's a bad school. And that, that's, that's what's out there um, in, the, in, the, in the building world. I think that if the district can find some way to improve that, then the district will have much more flexibility to handle the growth on the east side of the district. I mean, if, it, if, if there's this around the city of the colony, if there's this can't go in there, you, you, have, a, you have a high school with 2,800 capacity. It's at 1,800. You have the ability to uh, feed some of the overflow into that school. But the problem is uh, builders don't want to build houses in a zone that feeds that. Now we have had some new subdivisions, for example, Hills and Kingswood, that has gone, uh, that we've seen you know, go into the zone, uh, but it's very early to just see what uh, the impact is on that from that neighborhood. But you know, the legends and, and the Cascades have all have all sold well and done well. But I, I do, I still think that there is a problem uh, with with the perception of feeding into the high school and I believe that the board has made exceptions to uh, homeowners in Meridian other areas of the, on the east side 
allowing them to choose Hebron High School, cool, high school over the column. But I do think that the matter is coming to a head because with the growth um, that is surrounding 121, it's in our recommendation that most of the, uh, the zoning issues it, it would be better if the students north of 121 went. I would just like to say what you just had to tell us was not easy, and I appreciate you being honest because um, I think you're right. Perception is a lot of, um, is the only thing that people pay attention to. And while we know that it's a great school and the kids are great and the teachers are great, um, former principal, you know, is, was wonderful and very young. Um, <laughs> Sitting in the audience. <laughs> um, but like you know, Little School High School has suffered from the same perception. And and I think that it's as a board and as um, administrators of the district, that is our job to, to alleviate those perceptions or turn those perceptions around and make them more truer to what those schools are. So I appreciate the honesty. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I appreciate it. And well, a few years ago, we did a demographic study, and they had us projected up going out at 65, 6,500, I mean, thousand. And I said, where are they going? So this is more realistic. I'm, I'm sure things were uh, going a lot faster until the economic bust. So if it picks back up, we don't know where it will go, but I think it will be a number of years before that happens. So I appreciate this. I do have one additional question. Um, in looking at the geographical areas for the cities, um, it's my understanding when I look at the maps, there are areas of the colony that do go south of 121. So is, am I correct in looking at that map that the colony does have city boundaries south of 121? And if so... City boundary, yes. Okay. Not the colony high school tenants. Yes, but there are portions of the city of the colony that are south of 121. Correct. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, item for discussion is by Dr. Penny Rudell, but before she comes, what the demographer just said indicates what I've always said. We have a great district. I don't care who you send us, we're going to do a great job with whomever. If you send them there, we will teach them. When you say that we're, we went from 9.7 in 2000 of our economically disadvantaged students at, to 29%, uh, percent, or from 9% to 29%, that is remarkable, the fact that we can still remain to be a recognized district with over 51,000. So I commend the staff, the teachers, the principals, families, everyone. We do a bang up job and we're going to continue. I told Dr. Waddell, we're building a lighthouse house district for the nation. Thank you, Dr. Waddell. Madam President, or Dr. Waddell, um, first policy that I'll discuss with you is regarding